The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right, so uh, this talk is uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Cloud Computing by Mark Hinkle. Uh, Mark is the all things open source, the community manager, whatever title you want to call it, at Citrix. So all the Citrix things, cloud stack, so on and so forth. Uh, basically, doer of all things open source at Citrix. Uh, so spoiler alert, the answer is 42. I hope you remember that. And without further ado, Mark Hinkle. Thanks, Jeremy. Is that working okay? Yeah. All right. How many people here have written, uh, read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? All right. I have peppered this with a bunch of references in there. Um, I have a lot of content to cover, so I will probably not spend that much time going into them and explaining the references, but if you see a couple uh, icons here and there, you'll, you'll get the inside jokes. I'll make some of the explicit ones. Jeremy already killed the punchline, so we all know how it's going to end. Um, as, as you said, I'm uh, Mark Hinkle. I am the open source guy at Citrix. I work on Apache Cloud Stack, which is cloud orchestration. I uh, work with the Zen Hypervisor. Um, open Daylight is the Linux Foundation's latest uh, project. It's their collaborative project. Actually, not the latest one uh, Zen project is, but uh, um, is an open source software defined networking controller. And uh, I have an open source background, so that's where I came from. I don't really need to give this slide, but be at, at Southeast Linux Fest, because you guys all probably have a good idea of why open source. But the one thing I like to drive home about why I like the solutions I work on is that they're user driven. Now, given the fact that I work for a $12 billion software company that develops software and it is vendor driven, um, that might be a little bit uh, ironic, but uh, um, the thing that we find is the user input into their products and solutions are what makes them good. And I think that's really a key point when I evaluate open source software is, is there a user community? There's a developer community, which is usually a subset of the users, but are there users solving real problems? Because a lot of software, is a, problem, is a solution looking for a problem. These things are usually informed by real world experience. So let's talk about cl cloud computing. Cloud computing is sort of like the infinite and probability drive that does everything, every how, everywhere, at all times. Um, if, you read the, if you read the press and you read the tech trades, what I really want to do is come up and make sure that you guys have the good framework. This is a, quick overview of what really is cloudy because contrary to popular belief, if it's connected to the internet, it is not necessarily in the cloud. Cloud is five things, and this is National Institute of Standards and Technology definition. On-demand self-service. I don't need to call somebody to get my stuff. It just happens. You go to a web page and you can add more storage to your Dropbox or your Gmail. You have broad network access. That means it's not just in a single data center with a single point of failure. You have multiple um, access points. Resource pooling. The fact is you no longer have individual servers that are points of failures. You have a collective pool of resources that are dynamically balanced. The big one, it, elasticity. It grows and it shrinks as you need it. And finally, as it grows or shrinks, you have measured service, which is how you're probably charged, for example. In Gmail, you get 10 gigabytes, or I don't know how many gigabytes you get free anymore from, from Google Apps, but when you hit a certain threshold, you can pay for more. When you drop below that, you don't have to pay anymore. Elasticity, measured service. So three kinds of clouds. We have the user cloud. That is your Google Apps. That is your Dropbox. That is your Salesforce.com. We're not going to talk a lot about that today. We're going to talk about the other two clouds. PaaS, which is Platform as a Service. This is a development sandbox 
that abstracts out the infrastructure so you have a environment for you to develop and deploy your apps. And then infrastructure as a service. And this is your traditional networking, compute, and storage, but it's all been virtualized and has these cloudy um, uh, characteristics that I just, the five characteristics I just talked about. So everything is a layer of abstraction. In the early days, we abstracted the hardware to virtualization, especially in storage and compute. Today, we're starting to see a lot of network virtualization happening. The next layer up was PaaS, is where we're taking out those storage and networking components and making them abstracted to the developer. And then finally, the end user gets to take advantage of all that, even though they probably don't know it's happening. <clears throat> The deployment models, real quick, hybrid, um, private and public clouds. Private, your cloud runs on your infrastructure. Public, it ri runs on someone else's. Hybrid, hybrid's like sex in high school. Everybody's talking about it, not a lot of people are doing it. That's basically taking workloads and they're running it on one place or the other and they're uh, theoretically, dynamically um, balancing those workloads. What I see more of is people that have decided they're going to do private cloud and public cloud, and they're deploying different payload, payloads to different clouds. <clears throat> All right. Now we're going to start talking about the clouds and the open source software used to build them. As I sort of gave the overview before of the, the paths, Physical resources, they're all abstracted. Then we have things like operating systems and VMs that, that virtualize those. And then those virtualized resources are what's consumed by your cloud. So when we talk about infrastructure as a service, they're consuming one, of, one or all three of the compute, the storage, and the network. <clears throat> some of it may be physical, some of it may be, be virtualized, but that's when it becomes cloud. It is actually that uh, elastic, on-demand, self-service um, dynamic that changes it. And then on the side, you normally have different tools that integrate with it. And then at the top, those are how people are consuming it through your mobile devices, through APIs, things like that. So let's talk about virtualizing that hardware. And the first thing we're going to talk about is compute hardware. So um, your server that does stuff, that runs programs, et cetera, can be divided up by a hypervisor into virtual machines. There's a lot of hypervisors out there. The, the four that are probably most popular are VMware, Hi Microsoft Hyper-V. The two open source ones are Zen, KVM. Zen, just my disclaimer, I work on Zen Project. I have a little, so it's for me to say I like one over the other. I have a propensity for Zen, but that um, should be obvious why I do that. Zen is now a Linux Foundation project. So it's, it's under Linux Foundation, just like the Linux kernel is. And it is supported by uh, Citrix. It's supported by Google. It's supported by Amazon, AMD, Intel. We all collaboratively work on Zen. The Linux Foundation owns that trademark. Um, and it is a hypervisor. It's a type one hypervisor. It does truly secure um, multi-tenant hosting a virtual machine. So you can, the, the nice thing about Zen is its focus is on security and stability. It's been around since 2007 or even before that. It's been around a long time, I forget the date. But uh, it has long history. Next one that I think is worth looking at is KVM. KVM has a high fidelity to the Linux kernel. Um, KVM runs is a one and a half, 1.5 hypervisor. So some of the things KVM does is it runs in user space. Some of the advantages of that are the way that you can manage your users in Linux. A lot of those tools work for KVM management. That's sort of its, its advantage. I've seen benchmarks on both of them that say one's better than the other, so I can't tell you that one is better than the other. It would have to depend on the, pay, on the workload you're using. Then, then there's VirtualBox, which I don't really look at as a server virtualization technology. It's a true, like it's a, 
workstation virtualization, it's a dev test environment, stuff like that, but I don't see a lot of people scaling out clouds using VirtualBox. OpenVZ is interesting. OpenVZ is a, um, is a sort of at that app virtualization level. I see a lot of people that are doing the same kinds of application. So uh, like one of the decision engines, one of the shopping engines I've seen out there that, that do shopping searches, they use OpenVZ because that workload is, con they have a lot of the same kind of workload and they do tons and tons of them. The other one that I think is interesting and I think has a legs in the future is LXC because just, because it's actually the Linux containers and it has a lot of the benchmarking I've seen for that is that it does really well in scalability for certain kinds of payloads and it does allow you to use the, uh, um, the tools for administering Linux operating systems already but it still gives you some isolation. My, my thought is this though, that if you're worried about multi-tenant environments, you might want to tend towards Zen. If you're looking for scalability and, um, or not scalability, but to, to integrate into your operating system, you might want to look at the LXC in the future. A lot of the cloud provider or orchestration layers I talked about later um, cover that. And then obviously you have VMware. Um, Citrix Zen server is based on Zen, Oracle VM is based on Zen, but they're not open source, and really I'm focusing on the open source stuff. When it comes to cloud, there aren't a lot of standards right now. Actually, there's only one that it was actually a regulated standard, and that would be um, uh, OVF, and that's a format that allows you to create virtual machines with some kind of metadata and move them around from cloud to cloud. Um, each one of the virtual machine or clouds out there like Amazon uh, Zen, or the, the hypervisors have their own format for virtual machines. But the idea with the OVF is you have this virtual machine which is a file system that has, has the payload that you're going to run and then some kind of metadata. And, and actually the standard says that you can add multiple, multi multiple virtual machines in one OVF package and distribute that whether or not the hypervisor or the cloud can consume that or not is, remains to be seen. So I think a lot of people, how many people here use cloud computing today from a IAS standpoint? So like Amazon, OpenStack, CloudStack, stuff like that, um, S3, um, okay. So when you go to generate your image that you're gonna put in the cloud, there's a couple ways to do it. You can um, <clears throat> mount a file system and install from some kind of binary, or you can create a um, VM through some kind of tool that is automated. So I see a lot of people that are looking to deploy a lot of machines and have some kind of tool to keep them up to date using tools like Bitnami. Um, Bitnami is uh, a repository of open source applications, and they're sort of business model is that they give you these virtual machines and then they provide updates as well. And so be like Red Hat Network, but for virtual machines, if that makes sense, or apt get update for these custom built machine, virtual machines. And we call them appliances because they're usually single use. So appliance, toaster, heats up bread, blender, chops stuff up, etc. But they're usually single purpose, they're lightweight, they're usually built on uh, juice uh, just enough OS so that they're um, not taking up an ordinate amount of disk space. Another tool that you can run yourself is Box Grinder. Um, Box Grinder is, uh, I think, an incubated Fedora project, and uh, you can create, use that tool, point it to repos, and actually create Linux distros or Linux appliances for your clouds, and you can specify what provider. So if you your target is Amazon, you can create an AMI. If you're a Zen cloud platform is your hypervisor, you can create a VM in the format that's appropriate for that, VMware, et cetera. Um, Oz is another one. Oz is a uh, command line tool that is uh, also similar, but it's, it's designed for just KVM. 
And then there's one that's actually pretty cool, and I don't think people, they do a good job of marketing it, is SUSE Studio. And uh, what they do is they, you create um, a spec file of all the stuff you want in, and they actually have a web interface, or they have an API. And that's the part that I think is interesting, is you can call SUSE Studio, which is a hosted online service, to create a custom-built distro for you via the API and script the con um, creation of that uh, VM so that it, it uh, spits out exactly what you want and then you can upload it to your cloud provider. <clears throat> now, I've been talking about VMs and, and virtualized compute resources, et cetera, and there's two terms that I wanna uh, touch base on is scaling out and scale up. When people first told me about the cloud, they said you just upload your application, it just runs forever, it's great, you have everything you need. Unfortunately, most applications are not designed to just consume an infinite amount of resource. It's within some set of parameters. So typically you have resource, you have things that, that scale up, that, that hit a, a certain amount of processing power, a certain amount of memory usage. And if, if you think of it in terms of Amazon, they have like a small, medium, large, extra large offering. And each one has a certain level of compute and RAM associated with it. So if I hit the ceiling of that, to, I, to be able to take advantage of more resources, I'd have to shut down that, that virtual machine and switch to a larger offering so that you can take advantage of, maybe one has four, meg, four gigs of RAM and you need eight gigs. You, you, retake, you take advantage of that offering. So that's scaling up. Now you have other applications, and I think a good example would be HA proxy and web servers. So you have a proxy that load balances and sends um, HTTP requests to different web servers. If you've hit saturated the number of requests that each one of those web servers um, needs, you can bring up another virtual machine and it can start handling those requests. So that's scaling out. One means that you're adding more resources to the pool. One of them means that you're adding more VMs to the pool. So does that all make sense? So I, I wanted to do that background so now when we get into some of these things that the terminology is consistent. So now we're gonna talk about infrastructure as a service. And in my world, that's three different um, uh, things that, that fall under infrastructure as service. One is compute, which is what we talked about here recently. One is storage, and one is networking. So those, those layers, one or all three of those things can be abstracted and then orchestrated by an orchestration layer, and that's what these uh, four projects I'm talking about today are. Apache Cloud Stack, once again, disclaimer, that's the stuff I work on, that's the stuff I like. Um, Apache Cloud Stack is top-level Apache project. I like it because it's very user-driven. Um, the VP of Apache Cloud Stack is a uh, operations guy at SunGuard, a hosting provider, and he, he runs the uh, project along with the um, project management committee. And what Apache Cloud Stack does is it orchestrates different <clears throat> collections of virtualized resources, so virtualized servers, virtualized <clears throat> storage, and physical storage, and it, it also orchestrates physical and virtual networking. So you can, for example, create an offering where I have, let's call it the self-offering, and that offering has X amount of compute, X amount of storage assigned to it, and things like firewall, ingress and egress rules. So access rules to that. So all three layers of the network stack, Apache Cloud Stack is, is orchestrating so that you can provide that in a self-service way. It also has a web portal um, so that you can delegate the creation of infrastructure to other people. It has a RESTful API. Those features are pretty common among these service providers. Um, Eucalyptus is very similar, except their, the place that they focus is they have an API and their, their number one focus is to provide 
true fidelity with the Amazon API. So if you're using Am Amazon Web Services, you instrument your tools to their API, you can continue to use the Eucalyptus API. Um, they do not have a web portal, but they have um, a project with um, Netflix. So Netflix runs a lot of their, all of their, not all of their infrastructure, but most of their infrastructure on Amazon. And they've provided a set of open source tools that they use to run Netflix. And so Eucalyptus uses something called Asgard, which is an open source um, project that Netflix makes out there. And Netflix actually has a cool project going on now, the Netflix Prize, where they're trying to get people to come up with the coolest uh, additions to their catalog. And it's like $10,000 prizes for um, coming up with the best open source. Open Nebula. Open Nebula falls in that same uh, uh, category. The thing that I think their, their uh, um, capabilities are best for or are widely consumed are at the university level for running compute clusters. So um, they can do other stuff, but I seem to notice a lot of their users are good at, at running things like Hadoop and um, parallel calculation stuff way above my, my head. Finally, there's OpenStack. How many people here have heard of OpenStack? Okay. How many people here have heard of CloudStack before me? How many people have heard of Eucalyptus before me? How about Open Nebula? Okay, just trying to get an idea. So OpenStack is very, they've done a great job of marketing um, their project. And they are a, uh, just like CloudStack, Eucalyptus, and Open Nebula, they do those same things. But OpenStack is a little bit more than that. OpenStack is a collection of like 27 projects. And OpenStack is housed under an OpenStack foundation. And the OpenStack foundation is subsidized by people that pay a lot of money to, um, to, be, to have influence in that. Um, and they've done a good job of creating awareness. But they have, they have a more modular approach. So they have lots of sub-projects, sort of like Apache has lots of sub-projects. And you can go and choose which sub-projects to put together. The one that's the most like the ones I just talked about was the compute engine, which is Nova. They have an image service that serves uh, um, templates and backups called Glance. They have an object storage, which is called Swift. Actually, I think they're dropping sort of those code names, but uh, Swift would be like Amazon S3. Um, they have an identity management service that, that ties all these pieces together called Keystone. And they have a uh, networking stack called Quant Quantum, which is uh, OpenStack networking, I think is what they call it now. But you can put all those things together. So they're more modular. And then there's a bunch of companies out there that are creating distributions. It's sort of like Linux. So there's people like um, Nebula and cloud scaling and other people that are taking these pieces together, not unlike people like Fedora or CentOS or Red Hat would, and, and create a distribution. So um, <clears throat> there's, there's also the, the whale and the petunia there for the, uh, um, there's an inside joke there. It's, but uh, basically, that is OpenStack. So that's, that's that IAS layer. Those are the tools that I think are worth looking at there. There's other ones, but those are probably the most popular and proven and have real users of that technology. What I want to talk about now is APIs. So everybody in the cloud has an API. The problem is that it seems like everybody's API is a little bit different. And people have, if you add a new feature and one cloud has it and the other one doesn't, then why would you have that in your API anyhow? So the de facto standard or the people seem to add as a, for the private cloud and the open source guys, we all try and create some level of Amazon compatibility because we assume that people are toe dipping in Amazon and some people decide to go the Amazon route, some people or other cloud provider and others decide that they need to build their own cloud. So we create APIs that like Apache CloudStack, Eucalyptus, and OpenStack have some level of 
Amazon compatibility. But if you're not sure, there are these things that are cloud abstractions, and these cloud abstractions give you a common API that can go out and control other clouds. So some, the guy who does jclouds, he calls it a cloud controller. So you write to the jclouds library, and then jclouds can actually orchestrate things in Amazon, in OpenStack, in CloudStack, so that you don't have to write to three different APIs if you had an OpenStack, a CloudStack, or a wet Amazon. It also, the real reason I think it's interesting is uh, um, because it's, uh, it allows you freedom to move back and forth to clouds with not re-instrumenting all of your management tools. So the little yellow guy in the corner is a babblefish. You know what the babblefish does? In the Hitchhiker's Guide, the guy goes to the planet and doesn't understand anybody, and he puts a fish in his ear, and then he understands everybody. So that is a babblefish, and the API, these cloud abstractions are the API, or the babblefish of the cloud world. So um, I listed them here, and all these slides are on SlideShare, and they're all hyperlinked, so really, when you're done, I'll give you the link to my SlideShare, and you can get the slides, and it has, if there's something you wanna go look at, and I have copious speaker notes because I feel like it's a lot of stuff to cover and I'm only covering it superficially, trying to give you an overview so you guys can go figure it out later on. <clears throat> so let's talk about storage in the cloud. So um, when it comes to cloud, one of the premises is, is the, um, that it's geographically disparate, which could mean multiple data centers within the same building or it could mean Europe, US, and Asia. For, it's just the idea that those, data, that those systems have distribution for uh, reasons of scale, um, redundancy, um, fallover, et cetera. The projects that I think are really cool in the cloud area are Ceph, which is a distributed file storage system to, by DreamHost. Um, they have integrated with uh, OpenStack and CloudStack, and um, back in the early on, I said I probably didn't need to tell you guys about open source, but the thing I think is interesting is it's user-driven solutions are my preference. DreamHost is a large hosting company that had this problem, and so they solved it, and so they had real problems to solve, and it informed how they solved it. Now. The Ceph project is a standalone open source project backed by a spin out of DreamHost called Ink Tank. But I like Ceph. Um, I hear lots of good things about Ceph. Um, allows you to use commodity hardware to do a distributed file system for, um, typically where I'm seeing it is for object stores, um, long term storage of data that doesn't change a lot versus <clears throat> other ways that you might store it, stay data. ClusterFS is a scale-out NAS system, and it um, aggregates storage over InfiniBand. Basically, Gluster is in the same category as Ceph. They have different productizations of Ceph. Um, the company Gluster was bought by Red Hat last year, I believe, and it is an open source project um, that's that Red Hat will integrate into their products, I would assume. Then you have OpenStack storage. And OpenStack storage, which is called Swift, allows you to create your own sort of S3 type of environment. And um, you can actually use that in conjunction with these file systems, Ceph and Gluster. They're not, all, they're not all apples to apples. They all are in the storage area for cloud. But the thing that's, that's interesting is OpenStack gives you that um, object store through their storage project, and then you can use Ceph or Gluster as, as a distributed file system underneath of, Ceph, underneath of OpenStack storage. How many people here know what RIAC is? Heard of it? No SQL database? Well, um, RIAC uh, is sponsored by a company called Basho, and the uh, no SQL people have figured out that um, it's really easy to access data if you um, store it in NoSQL, hash the location of that data, and then it makes it easy for a lookup. So that's why they took 
Ryak and created an object store and uh, <clears throat> is an S3, has an S3 API compatibility, is sort of like OpenStack storage. OpenStack storage has high fidelity with um, all the OpenStack projects. Ryak is an alternative that has certain um, technological advantages that I don't have time to go into today, but um, as I look at the way you build your cloud, I think it's gonna be a la carte, depending on what you're trying to do, and I'm trying to say that some stuff's well integrated, but if you choose to look at, at an alternative, these are sort of your alternatives here. Last one I talk about is Sheepdog, and the only reason that I, would, I really reference this a lot is if you are a heavy KVM shop, Sheepdog has certain um, uh, advantages for KVM hypervisors. It doesn't work with the other hypervisors. It was developed by NTT um, for running large clusters of KVM. Um, if you're a Fedora KVM kind of person, you might want to look at, at Sheepdog. Now let's talk about PaaS. So, and the infrastructure as a service, it all made sense to us because we all understood computing, we all understood storage, we all understood networking, at least in concept. Now we have this idea of PaaS, and that's basically having this layer that can, gives you a sandbox to deploy your app in, but that sandbox actually interfaces with your compute, your storage, and your network, and allows it to scale up and scale down without having to provision at that low level the same way you would if you were deploying an application, like a three-tier application, a LAMP stack or something, on top of the cloud. It provides that sort of packaged um, development environment. Some of them, um, they support different domain languages. So Cloud Foundry is was one that supports um, uh, Java, uh, Grail, Scala, et cetera, Python and PHP through some ports. Um, Cloudify is another one by Gigaspaces. OpenShift is Red Hat's. Staccato is a fork of Cloud Foundry because um, I don't know if that's changed, but originally Cloud Foundry didn't accept uh, patches from outside of VMware. So it was open source licensed, but whether or not it was really open to participation, um, the governance was a little tightly controlled. So Active State does that. WSH2 Stratus is a, another one. And there's a little difference in the WSO2 versus the other paths. I think the WSO2 and uh, there's another company that isn't open source, but their tools are open source called CloudBees. They look at this continuous deployment model where they, they have tools that allow you to check out code and deploy that code into your pass and automate the whole process from source control to um, build, to deployment. And uh, the other ones, the Cloud Foundry, the Cloudify, the OpenShift, lean more towards their standalone project to put that deployable code into. Um, WSO2 just predated what we call PaaS today. So they, they had a bunch of tools for actual um, application lifecycle management. This, the thing that's gonna make this cool someday, I think, is so earlier we talked about OVF. So you had some kind of standard way to deploy an application or a virtual machine stack. At the point where you can have some kind of workload that can move seamlessly across different paths, that'll be interesting to me. Sort of like virtual machines, you can actually convert virtual machines using tools like KEQ or QEMU to um, recreate a format from VMware to Zen to KVM. Um, when you can actually take these payloads and automate moving them from one cloud to the other, it'd be interesting. In the proprietary space right now, if you look at something like Heroku, which is a PaaS by Salesforce, Elastic Beanstalk by Amazon, they both are sort of Java PaaSes, but they're, they're hosted proprietary PaaSes. And theoretically, you can move those apps, but it's not very seamless because there's different um, differences between them. When they can start consuming something a payload that is um, consumable by multiple clouds, that'll be, I think, very interesting for us. So that is PaaS. Here's the one that's rather new, 
and I think is most interesting today, it's the hottest stuff out there, is software-defined networking. So software-defined networking basically abstracts out the data in the control layers so that you can actually centrally control network devices from, from a control, yeah, it sounds redundant, from a controller that actually can talk to model devices and make changes to the flow tables so that you don't have to go into each device and reconfigure it and move, because as, as we have the ability to bring up and down virtual machines in seconds, you don't want to have to have the network routing be a choke point. And it had been till um, the not too distant past, things like, uh, but now you have um, controllers arising that are software defined. I think like VMware's, ne or VMware, uh, Cisco's Nexus switch is a software switch that allows you to make some changes and dynamically administering them rather than going in with like Cisco works and individually updating each router, each switch. So if we look at networking, we want to have the same ability to centrally control it like we can with our virtual machines. We want to be able to self-provision networks. That's the one that's sort of scary. Anybody here a network admin? So now we're going to let users create their network services on their own. It's a little bit within, within reason. That is, that is the idea. It's a little sketchy, but um, the idea is that if I can bring up a virtual machine in a data center through self-service portal, I still need to be able to have the networking come up. And there's certain things that we use today, like VLANs, to, to give and tag networks to actually allow these networks to interact. But they have certain limits. We also need the elasticity and scalability that we see from um, virtual machines and storage in the network layer. And we still need the redundancy. So we're going to trivialize how complicated networking is and give every user who's able to spin up a um, instance to have virtual self-service networks. And the thing that enables that, and I'm, I'm a little tongue-in-cheek there. I, I think that there's, we have a framework that allows, allows administrators to delegate that. But we're going to use the OpenFlow protocol to actually use that secure channel to cr create um, changes in these flow tables for these switches. And some of these switches are open source. Some of them um, have, uh, are now, a lot of manufacturers are sh shipping OpenFlow capable switches so that you can use these network controllers to do that. Now for the network controllers. There's a couple out there, um, and they're at different levels. Some are, some are do routing, some of them are very simple, like Open vSwitch, which a lot of the hypervisors already imp implemented because they needed um, <clears throat> a multi-layer virtual switch to handle the uh, uh, migration of virtual machines, and that's sort of the driver. The one that, that uh, there's one out there from uh, Big Switch Networks called Floodlight. Um, it's Apache licensed. Uh, it works today. Uh, another project that is not um, a controller per se, but actually a, uh, a toolkit that allows you to um, convert your uh, existing switches to have open flow compatibility is Indigo, and that comes from Stanford. The one I work on is uh, Open Daylight, and that is at the Linux Foundation. The, the basis for that technology is Citri Cisco's One controller, which they donated to the Linux Foundation. So that's going to be a controller that's pluggable. And they have 12, 19, 20, about 25 um, company vendors in a, user consor in a vendor consortium driving the development of it. So uh, Red, Hat, Micro Red Hat, Microsoft, Cisco, Brocade, Citrix, VMware, Arista, Juniper Networks, I could go on. 
um, but my memory is not that good. All our participants in this uh, consortium, and the idea is that the network controller handles the um, layer three networking and it's pluggable for all these people like, um, for example, Citrix does, has a, a load balancer called a Netscaler to make their kind of code pluggable in that and we'll be releasing more code into there. So Brocade has stuff, Juniper has stuff, Cisco has stuff, so it's, it's sort of the, the Chrome, Chrome kind of approach where you have, have a base um, useful controller, but then everybody will have plugins to that. The thing is that right now we just announced it in April, so in the third quarter of this year, I think will be the first release of something that's really um, usable outside of a development environment. OpenStack Quantum. OpenStack um, is it's, it's, it allows you to create network services associated with your OpenStack node of a cloud. So if you want to add firewalling services or routing services or tunnels, et cetera, VPNs, you can add that using OpenStack Quantum. And they, the OpenStack Quantum has a northbound and southbound API, so it can interface with cloud and it can interface with other um, software to create um, more robust services. I think like uh, F5 load balancing. I think you can add load balancing through quantum, if I recall correctly. And I mentioned Open vSwitch, which is a open source switch, um, largely contributed to by a company called Nasira, which uh, VMware bought last year, or this year for like a billion dollars. So um, they think that it's the hypervisor people and the virtualization people think it's very. Um, important to have dynamic networking to go along with their virtualized infrastructure. And I do too. Does that make sense? And basically now there's three things, yeah. How do you like that? There's three things that are um, sort of the pillars of cloud computing. It's storage, compute, and networking. And now I've gone through all those tools that allow you to take advantage of open source software to create uh, clouds based on those technologies. Now we're going to talk a little bit about stuff you can do on them. And I've, in the past, I talked about applications that can run on them and build your own SaaS and stuff, and, and really it's too complex a topic. But the one topic that is really well suited to the cloud is big data. And that picture is uh, Deep Thought, the uh, computer from <clears throat> uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. And the reason big data is interesting is today we create more data than ever before. Unfortunately, we create a lot of crap. And literally, I mean, how many law cats can we have? How many pictures of what you had for dinner can we have? How many, you know, pictures of your cat, you know, doing something cute that's only cute to you. That's all right. Some of this, within that, that stream of all the data we create, there's useful stuff. And the problem is that we have so much data. This is like a, a quote of how much data we create. But basically, um, our storage capacity is, is so cheap now that we can each create terabytes of data in our lifetime. And of those terabytes of late data, maybe only megabytes of that data are interesting. So we need to have the ability to actually access it and get to the stuff that's really important. So there's, there's sort of two growing trends in big data. First is the evolution of the NoSQL database. So in the old days, we had tables that have rows and columns. Today. The NoSQL database has key pairs. So you have some value associated with a hash that says this is where that data lives and gives you a column for you to just look stuff up. And the, thing, the ones that are popular today are, are Cassandra, which is Apache project, um, CouchDB, which is actually a document store. It seems to, it's more geared to holding documents. Um, HBase is another one. Uh, 
hypertable. MongoDB, MongoDB has a, seems to be getting a, a lot of uh, play as document store. A company called TenGen behind it's been very successful. Um, all these ones, I'm going to give you the link because we're, we're sort of running low on time and I want to make sure that we hit all the content. But I sort of gave you a little description. There is a, uh, in the, in the uh, notes there, I think it's, uh, there's actually a list of, of uh, entries at the NoSQL database that gives you comparisons for depending on what kind of uh, um, use case you have for it. You may want to store documents. You may want to store objects. You just may want to store massive amounts of data. For example, your tweets. If you had 5,000 tweets, they're all of a format that are um, facilitated easily by uh, key pair, key value pair database. And it allows you to look up that clever tweet you said about how great this talk was and how much fun it was three years from now. All right. So here's the stuff that I think is really interesting is the MapReduce. What MapReduce does is you have this big set of pro problem data. And the, as I pointed out earlier with my Facebook graph is we have all this data and basically what you want to do is sort through this data and get to the stuff that's useful. So rather than querying it linearly the way you would in an SQL database, what you would do with MapReduce is you create these, the MapReduce takes it, breaks it up into smaller jobs, does the compute, and then spits out some solution data. And that idea was championed at Google and Yahoo, and then Yahoo uh, actually created this open source project called Hadoop, and Hadoop is a MapReduce. It's also an ecosystem of other pro projects out there, but basically what it does is it has this great, the ability to take these big problem sets and reduce them down into something that you can use, that you can use through some kind of manipulation. It's a top level project and it has multiple vendors behind it. It has a lot of users behind it. Um, it is more than just um, chopping up all that data. It has a whole ecosystem of uh, projects around it. So it has um, the Hadoop file system, HDFS, has the MapReduce, which are the two core parts. And then it has these non-relational databases like Hive and HBase above it. Um, a scripting language called Pig, and a machine learning language called Mahout. It took me a whole while to figure out how this stuff all worked together, so I just wanted to give you a little diagram of, you know, these, these tools like the, like the scripting language helps you create your jobs and, and uh, <clears throat> sort through the data. The, the map reduces the workhorse and the engine of all of it, and then you can store that data into a data warehouse like Hive. Now, I've seen a lot of traditional data companies, and in my slides online, I, I put like a big slide of how all these companies interrelate and whether who are in the data warehousing, who are in the BI space, et cetera, which open source projects fit into them. Um, but basically, there are a lot of tools out there that Oracle and Teradata, Teradata and other traditional big data companies are looking at to integrate. So if you already use, SAS is a little slower to do that. They, they've sort of an island onto themselves, but I've seen SAP and Teradata and other ones have, have uh, integrations with Hadoop recently. So the thing I wanted you to, to get across to you today was that <clears throat> the amount of machine data we're creating is increasing exponentially from everything from mobile phones to social networking to GPS devices. And we're, we have a lot more things that are more advantageous to manipulate in real time. So that is why these tools have evolved. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that because of cloud services out there, people have ex access to these clusters and compute in a more Readily, ready fashion than ever before. You can go provision this stuff and run it through cloud providers today in minutes versus before you had to run all that 
data warehousing stuff in-house. And because it's elastic, you don't have to keep it running for your job. You can run those jobs and then kill it when it's done. <clears throat> but when they talk about big data, what we're talking about is uh, making the access to that data faster and easier. So, The last topic I really want to touch on is cloud management tools. So now I have the ability to put my credit card in at Amazon or cloud provider and spin up a ton of machines really, really quickly. And in the old days, when I was still allowed to have root access on my machines, I would get on the phone, I would call Dell or HP, I'd order the server, it'd show up, I'd carry it into the data center, I'd unbox it, I'd rack it, I'd bust my knuckles, I'd cuss for a couple minutes, I'd plug in the wires in the back, and then I'd install my operating system. That could take a month. Now it takes minutes. So I needed to take, we needed to take those tools, me in the old days would have been the meat cloud, and really look at how we're going to automate so that you can keep up with, with cloud scale. And a lot of the tools that I advocate are ones that can be um, scripted or automated to do repetitive tasks over and over again. The ones that are really good are smart about it. So. Um, do you know if this, this goes till 12.30, is that right? Okay. So there's four kinds of tools out there that I think are important. Uh, provisioning, config management, orchestration, and automation, and monitoring. Uh, monitoring is the, the most boring of it. Nobody does monitoring well, it seems. It's hard to monitor stuff, but um, those are the four classifications. When it comes to the cloud, what I think you got to look at is tools that you can put together to create a tool chain, just like developers put together tool chains, where a set of tools <clears throat> inform, where one, the output of one tool informs the input of the other. So when I provision something, I want it to alert my configuration management tool to go configure it. When it's configure, configured it, I want it to talk to my automation tool so that it starts that configured virtual machine. And I want it to also tell my monitoring tool that it's there. So. <clears throat> when you put tools together, and this is actually in the appendix for my slides, which will be on SlideShare, I want you to take things like when we talked about SUSE Studio earlier, I want OpenStack or CloudStack to be actually, um, for it to be able to call that through some kind of intermediary. Then use things like uh, Cobbler to actually update the uh, virtual machines. Uh, anybody go to the Ansible um, talk earlier? So use a tool, I, I use Puppet and Chef there, but you can use something like Ansible in that tool chain. And in Mike's talk, he talked about using Ansible to update Nagios after you configure it to monitor it. So that all these things are automated and when you put something into production, you start the process off, it goes into production through this automated tool chain. So if you're doing tons of stuff, it's uh, um, easy for you to keep up with that scale because the um, former roadblock of me racking those servers by hand has gone away. And uh, other, the ability to take advantage of this elasticity is um, also predicated on the ability to scale out, keep up with that scale. Now I talked a lot about building your own cloud today. Um, there are other tools out there for things like Amazon and other clouds where you can host it somewhere else and uh, use them. Uh, for Amazon, I would say that you might want to look at the, the Netflix on GitHub. They have some interesting tools. Um, some of them are really geared to doing large-scale implementations of stuff on Amazon. Uh, one of the things Asgard is there, uh, I talked about a little earlier, is a web interface. Um, there's also uh, tons, of, there's I think 25 projects there. Um, Simeon Army actually goes out and um, or creates the, <clears throat> uh, let's see, Chaos Monkeys actually goes, randomly shuts down stuff to see how fault tolerant is. So they build their application so that if there's failure, it automatically recovers. Chaos Monkey actually does that. It's part of their Simeon Army of tools. Um, 
that goes out and just wreaks havoc in your system in a large scale cloud. And if your cloud handles that, if you're serving your applications in a redundant manner, it shouldn't affect your cloud, but they actively do that. That's practice, they do it. Um, places like Etsy and Amazon as well. Other one I'd mention um, that I like is Scalar, S-C-A-L-R, which helps you do web scale stuff in the cloud and they support CloudStack, Amazon, um, OpenStack, I think, a bunch of clouds, but they're, they provide those tools that when we talked about scale out, they do the scale out stuff for web stuff um, pretty effectively. Now, I was hurrying to get through this, but uh, um, as Jeremy told you early on, the answer to the cloud is 42. The problem is the question, and the question is, what the heck do you wanna do with your cloud? And that's the question people don't ask enough. Like, I would love for everyone here to use Zen Hypervisor and CloudStack and Daylight because they're the three projects I work on, but that may not serve your purpose. So I think you gotta figure out is A, is the application or set of applications you want worth building a cloud for or do you wanna host it? And you can host it on an OpenStack cloud at InterNAP, a CloudStack cloud at a ton of providers from all over the place. Um, you can, you can ho use Amazon's cloud and still take advantage of cloud computing, but if you're gonna build it yourself, you should know what the use case is. Is it gonna be geographically distributed? If you're gonna just put it in a data center and have dual, single entry into your data center, you have a point of failure that you wanna have in a true cloud. If you're gonna um, not have the ability to put out truly redundant distributed storage, then maybe you're not taking full advantage of the cloud. And that may be all right, but that's really not the full promise of what the cloud Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability, 
is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? 
Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked.